evening uh, we're going to be reading 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, to get what I hope we'll see is a, is a grand example of uh, one person in Scripture who um, was afflicted in some way uh, by the Lord, at least he allowed this affliction, and didn't heal him for a particular reason. Again, I, I see it as one grand example of why it is we should not expect that the Lord is necessarily going to make us uh, healthy or to heal us in every given situation. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. Uh, here Paul is sharing one of his own personal experiences. And again, this is that text that makes us wonder whether or not Paul actually died and may have been uh, raised again to life, and perhaps uh, the, the injuries he sustained that actually took his life uh, might have caused some kind of lingering illness or at least some injury that uh, he sought the Lord for his mercies, but the Lord did not deliver him. And again, that's the thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. Is it actually a spiritual affliction or is it a physical one? Um, you know, some think it might be the... Uh, the uh, problem that Paul had, uh, he does mention to the Galatians at one point that their love for him was so great that if he had asked them, uh, well, I guess something to the effect that they would be willing even to, uh, to give to him their, their eyes, as it were, to help him. They would have plucked out their eyes and given them to him. And we wonder, well, why would they do something like that? Except perhaps that might have been Paul's affliction. Anyway, let's read the text. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 1. Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man will I boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast except in regard to my weaknesses. For, I do not wish to, for if I do wish to boast, I shall not be foolish, for I shall be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this so that no one may credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, again, it... Um, You'll notice that Paul begins by seemingly distancing himself from this man who had these revelations, but he goes on to tell us that because of the surpassing greatness of these revelations, to keep him from exalting himself, uh, there was given him this thorn in the flesh. So he is speaking about himself. Notice also he says whether in the body or out of the body, he doesn't know, so Paul isn't quite sure whether he died or not in this case, and some think it might be when he was stoned I believe it was outside of Lystra uh, when he was stoned and then uh, they, they left him there for dead. The disciples gathered around him and he, st he stood back up suddenly and walked back into the city. Perhaps this was the time that this, this occurred. But it's also clear that there was something that he was afflicted with, some kind of weakness that he asked the Lord three times that he might deliver him from, but the Lord did not deliver him. So at least in this instance, we would say, it's not always God's will that we be delivered from our weaknesses and afflictions. If it was, certainly that would take place. So again, this is what we're going to consider this evening. We're going to consider whether it is true what uh, the, those health and wealth movement actually say, 
that it is God's will, if you have enough faith, that you be healed from every single one of your afflictions. If you have enough faith, you can be uh, healthy 100% of the time. If you have enough faith, you can also be rich. Basically, you can have whatever it is you want. The last time we were uh, looking at why we believe the charismatic gifts have ceased. Remember, we saw that they were given to communicate God's word. Uh, that's what, of course, um, you know, the, uh, the prophets were doing, the apostles were doing, and they're speaking from God as well as their writing of these letters. But we also saw that the miracles that they performed, for the most part, were meant to confirm that the word they were speaking was actually God's word and not simply the word of man. Now, we saw that that was especially true of the Jews. I mean, the Lord was confirming that uh, what, this, what was going on, uh, Christ's work and the ministry of the apostles, was actually the fulfillment of all the promises that God had made to them. We noted that tongues, in particular, were given as a sign to unbelieving Israel. We also saw that once the scriptures were complete and God had given his perfect revelation of his will, it's, uh, that the revelation ceased. We also noted that it was uh, interesting that it happened just before judgment fell on Jerusalem. As the Lord completes his revelation, completes his proof to Israel that this is, in fact, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and this is the new covenant that he had promised, then the Lord withdraws these gifts. The gifts cease because... There was no longer revelation being given. Uh, the, the, complete, the completeness of the scriptures were there and no longer a need to confirm the scriptures, but again, because it's complete. Remember what we saw Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10. When the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with, which historically in the church they've seen a twofold fulfillment. When God gives his perfect revelation, then those gifts that were necessary before the completion of the scriptures will cease because now we have the completeness of that revelation. Certainly the secondary fulfillment would be in heaven where perfect knowledge comes, we no longer need that which is partial. Now this evening we want to deal with something that is closely related to the charismatic gifts, although not always, and that is the health and wealth movement. Now, virtually everyone in this movement believes in the continuance of the gifts. Now, we don't want to say that everyone who believes that the gifts continue are in this camp because they're not. There are many churches that believe in the continuance of charismatic gifts that do not believe what health and wealth people teach. But everyone in the health and wealth camp do believe in the continuance of the gifts. And one thing we should also note is this, that in this group, uh, the use of the gifts is far more extreme than it would be in, in these other camps because the health and wealth movement depends on these charismatic gifts to continue, especially the health part of it with regard to God healing you. I was a part of one of those churches for seven years, and uh, there was a miracle rally. It seemed like every week they wanted the Lord to do signs and miracles and to heal people, and that was a regular part of the service. And certainly the idea of, of, um, of wealth, that God wants to bless you, many of the messages supposedly that came from God had to do with your giving so that God will give back to you and make you wealthy. So again, a great deal of this health and wealth movement depends on the continuance of the gifts uh, for these beliefs even to exist, which means that... Um, since we've already seen their purpose in the, uh, the conclusion of the charismatic gifts, that should tell us right away that the health and wealth movement can't be correct. Now, what is it that they actually believe? Well, they believe that the Lord's will for his people is that you never get sick, first of all. That if you have enough faith, there is no reason why you should ever be sick was looking around online. Um, it was interesting, actually. I went to uh, different websites of some of the more prominent figures looking for their statements of faith. On one website, I think I found something Unitarian. They didn't understand the Trinity. But on most of the websites, I discovered that in a number of areas, they, they believe true beliefs. They're orthodox in many different ways. And their websites were somewhat subdued 
from what you actually see in, in their practice. Um, in other words, you don't see statement after statement about health and wealth, but you do see some statements of orthodoxy. There is truth there, but that truth is so underemphasized that as to almost be absent from their ministries. When you see their television programs, you don't hear a great deal about the gospel, but you do hear a great deal about God's wanting to heal you and God's wanting to make you healthy. But here's a statement I found on one of the websites. This one happens to come from Richard Roberts, who is the son of Oral Roberts with regard to health. And this is in their statement of faith. He says this, healing is for soul, mind, and body, wholeness. In healing, Jesus deals with every phase of our being, every area of our lives, with the full intention of bringing wholeness. Being made whole means healing and restoration for whatever part of the person, uh, what, for whatever part of the person is ill or in bad health. When a person is spiritually sick or out of tune with God and himself, it affects his body and mind. When he's mentally or emotionally sick, it has a tendency to negatively affect his soul and body. And when sickness and disease strike the body, everything about the person is affected. Wholeness is the highest form of healing. And again, the belief is this is what the Lord's will is for you. Wholeness, that you be healthy in soul, mind, and body. I we'll certainly agree with the soul part of it, but we'll, we'll look at some of these others. Now, we wouldn't dispute some of the things that are said here. There is a connection between the soul and the body, and what affects one will necessarily affect the other. But we would dispute that it's the Lord's will that you be perfectly healthy at all times in this life because of the connection between your soul and body. Certainly, they're both going to work better when both are working well, but it's not always God's will that we be well in necessarily either of these areas. Uh, when you consider and some of the struggles that Christians have even with regard to their spiritual well-being. And secondly, the Lord wants you to be wealthy. That if you have enough faith, the Lord will make you rich, at least if you are willing to do the necessary work of planting uh, the seeds of those riches, which means giving to a God-ordained ministry. You have to give in order to receive. Again, from Robert's web, uh, website. Seed faith is both an act and a process. Seed faith giving and seed faith living. Jesus likened having faith to the act of planting seed for a desired result. Seed faith is based on the seed time and harvest principle in which everything starts as a seed. Seed faith becomes a lifestyle, a way of living, sowing and reaping and giving and receiving. These are the three miracle keys of seed faith. First, make God the source of your total supply. Second, plant seed for a desired result. And three, expect a miracle. By the way, number two is where you give to their ministry. Now again, we wouldn't dispute the fact that God promises to take care of you. If you seek him first, Jesus says, in his kingdom, and his righteousness, he will provide for all of your needs. And he also promises that if you will honor him with the first of your increase, that he will bless you materially as well as spiritually. But we do disagree with the fact that God intends this to be the road to riches as a method of becoming rich. And we're going to see why that is. What I'd like to do this evening is to consider a couple of things. And the first one is why it is that these people believe what they believe. I mean, what are they basing this on? And then secondly, why we believe they're wrong. Why this, this is not what the scripture teaches, but we want to see, in fact, what it does teach. So first of all, why are there, there, are there those who believe that the Lord wants us to be healthy and wealthy? Well, the simple answer to that question is because they believe that that is what God has promised in his word, to heal all your sicknesses and to make you rich if only you will believe. Now, with, first of all, with regard to healing you, they would point out the fact that didn't Jesus go around healing everyone who was sick? 
Uh, doesn't Matthew say in Matthew 8:17 that this was to fulfill what Isaiah said would be true of the Messiah? He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Didn't Jesus in his work provide healing for everyone? Didn't he actually go to the cross in order to uh, make us whole in the sense that uh, Roberts is, is referring to? Peter writes, and he himself bore our sins on his body or in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. Didn't Jesus go to the cross and die on the cross in order to make you well, in order to make you healthy? And isn't all that you need to receive what Christ has done, isn't it just faith? I mean, isn't that how those who received miracles during Jesus' ministry, isn't that how they were made well? Matthew writes in chapter 9, verses 20 through 22, and a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will get well. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. At once, the woman was made well. And Luke writes in Luke 8, 49 through 50, while he was still speaking, and, and it had to do again with the woman with the hemorrhage, someone came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died, do not trouble the teacher anymore. But when Jesus heard this, he answered them, do not be afraid any longer, only believe and she will be made well. I mean, what more do you want, right? I mean, the Lord promises that he will heal you. He wants you to have it, all you need is faith to receive it. Just reach out and touch the hem of his garment just believe and you will be made well. Now, they also believe God wants you to be wealthy. All you need to do is have faith. Didn't the Lord say through Malachi, Malachi 3, 10, and 11, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. Didn't Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount, or is it the Sermon on the Plain? We're not quite sure. In Luke chapter 6, it's a parallel passage or another sermon. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. I heard that verse just about every week in the church that I was attending during those seven years. And again, isn't faith all that you need to receive these riches that God wants to give you in opening the windows of heaven or in your giving to give back to you? Jesus said to his disciples, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. And again, he says, therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. If you have faith, all, then that, well, that's really all you need. If you have faith because God has promised it, you can be healthy all your diseases can be taken away, and you can be wealthy. Now, one question occurred to me when I was in this church for several years, even as a youth, because I was there from about age 12 to about age 18 or so. If this is true, then why are there so many who are following this line of thinking who never actually become healthy or wealthy? Some actually die. Well, the reason they'll tell you is because you don't have enough faith. God promises it, and he says if you have faith, you'll receive it. If you don't receive it, it's because you don't have enough faith. That's what they teach. And James does write, after all, if you're going to receive something from God, you must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven, tossed by the wind. 
If you fail to receive from the Lord, it's, it's your fault. It's not God's fault. And so people in this line of thinking, they spend basically their whole lives trying to get the doubt out of their hearts so that they can cash in on what they're sure God wants to give them by way of health and by way of money. And as I've said, I do know there was one individual in the church I was attending for those years who had some kind of a disease, but he refused to go to the doctor for it and it ended up killing him. You see, if you go to the doctor, then you're doubting that God can heal you. You're showing your lack of faith. Otherwise, you'd just be trusting that God's going to heal you. You wouldn't go to the doctor. And I also saw many of them, at least not during that time frame, but there are many people who have gone to the grave poor because they had given all of their money in seed faith to one of these prosperity gurus, while the gurus themselves, of course, became rich off of those trying to get rich, trying to cash in on God's promises. By the way, a lot of these health and wealth gurus secretly go to the doctor when they get sick because they know they're not going to get well in the way they're telling you that you should get well. Now, I am being somewhat harsh on them, and, and really I think we should be because a lot of them have led a lot of people astray into what you might say is the, the cult of uh, materialism. They're training people that God will give you what your lustful heart desires. If you just you know, pull the right levers and push the right buttons and say the right things, God will pay off. Now, I'm not meaning to say that everyone who believes along these lines is necessarily going to be a charlatan. Perhaps some of these people actually believe it. But I have seen a number of them that have been exposed. And even though they've been exposed, they continue to do this ministry. They continue to promote these things. They continue to try to deceive people. There are many, many people who are involved in this, and I would say the majority of them are not sincere, but are actually trying to fleece the sheep. Now, what is wrong with this kind of thinking? Okay, we've seen what it is they're looking at and what it is they're telling you that you can receive from the Lord if you just have enough faith. What's wrong with this? Are they, are they right or are they wrong? I mean, we just read from the scriptures, it seemed that they'd have a case here. Will God heal you if you have enough faith? Will God make you rich if you just simply believe? We need to realize that those who teach this doctrine are doing what a person has to do in order to make the Bible teach what they want it to say when this isn't actually what the Bible says. They have to pull scriptures out of their context to put a different spin on them to make you look at it in a different way. And then they have to completely neglect all the other scriptures that are in the Bible that speak against these beliefs. And they're pretty good at that. I mean, they, they, can, they focus so much on these other verses taken out of context, they brainwash the people who are listening to them so that the people can't even see the other verses that exist in scripture that are clearly contrary to what they're being taught. So what is it we're looking at in Scripture that makes us believe that the Lord doesn't necessarily want us to be healthy or wealthy? Well, first of all, with regard to health, we need simply to recognize God's never promised in Scripture to free us from every disease in this life. As a matter of fact, he tells us it's going to be quite the opposite of that. We need to realize that the passages that they have used to prove this do not mean what they say these things mean. Now we do recognize, again, I'll, I'll draw your attention back to what we've seen regarding the purpose of those gifts and why the healings actually took place. It is true that Jesus took our infirmities and carried away our diseases and he did it in a very literal way in Palestine. But he did that in order to prove that he was the one that God sent into the world to carry away those sicknesses and infirmities that were even much more serious than the ones that afflict our bodies and those are the ones that afflict our souls. The spiritual diseases that would have destroyed us, not our physical diseases. We need to remember that he healed physical illness mainly to show us that he was the one who could heal our souls. And Jesus says, what does a profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? The soul is much more important than the body. The miracles he did, the healings he performed, he did during a specific time 
to prove that he was the Messiah, the one who could deliver us from our sins. And this other often quoted passage from Peter that we've already seen. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. He wasn't speaking here about physical healing. He was speaking here about spiritual healing. Jesus bore our sins that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. It was through his wounds on the cross that your soul was healed and delivered. If you are trusting in him, your soul is healed. The guilt of your sins is taken away and you are made whole spiritually so that when you die, you will not go to hell, but rather to heaven. So not only can you not use those verses with regard to what people happen to receive in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ or the fact that miracles are a continuing norm for today, but you need to realize that the Bible does not teach that it is the Lord's will that you be 100% healthy at all times. As a matter of fact, it teaches the opposite. We just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that the Apostle Paul himself was not healed of his affliction. And he prayed three times that God would remove it, but the Lord would not remove it. And he tells us that that was God's will. That his strength, that God's strength would be perfected in Paul's weakness. And that Paul was content with this. That he would rather be weak that the power of God might dwell in him rather than be well and not have that power. We read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 27, that uh, the Philippians sent Epaphroditus to Paul to minister to him in prison, and that Epaphroditus nearly died in seeking to minister to Paul. Paul told Timothy on one occasion to take some wine for his stomach and for his frequent ailments. Why didn't he say, Timothy, you don't have enough faith. Believe the promise of God and you will be made well. That's what the health and wealth gurus want to say, but the fact is that's not what Paul told him to do because it wasn't God's will that Timothy be delivered from that affliction. Now again, the point is this, that these healings that took place were not an end in themselves. They were not a promise that God made to all of his saints throughout the ages that you can be made well of any affliction that you have, but it was a means to an end to confirm the word of God that was spoken. Jesus was doing the miracles that the Lord had prophesied Messiah would do. These were his divine credentials to prove who he was. And when the apostles were doing miracles, it was that it may be confirmed also to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles that this is in fact the word of God. And once it was confirmed, the miracles ceased, the supernatural gifts ceased with it once God's word was complete. We need to realize as well that the Lord has a purpose for sickness. He has a purpose for affliction, to test our faith, to strengthen our faith, uh, to help us rely upon him more. Because what happens when a Christian is afflicted? That Christian seeks the Lord. And that's exactly what God intends when he afflicts his people. The more he afflicts them, the more they seek after him. That's the way the Christian life works. That's what's true of a true Christian when we undergo adversity. It, it forces us closer to the Lord. That's the effect it has upon us. The effect it has upon a non-Christian is to drive them away from the Lord. It's one way we can know whether or not we're believers is when we go through trials, when we go through afflictions. Are they driving us to the Lord or are they driving us away? Now, we do want to make sure that we understand that it's not, we're not saying, I'm not saying, that God never heals. And sometimes God does heal. Sometimes he heals in answer to prayer when it's his will. But he no longer gives men the, the ability or the gift to heal because his word is complete. By the way, I, uh, one thing that I thought would be interesting to note is the character of the miracles that our Lord actually did and the apostles actually did in Scripture. When they performed miracles, it stopped traffic. People were amazed. They couldn't believe their eyes what they had just seen 
And they said, the power of God is here to heal. Even his opponents could not deny that the Lord had operated in such a way as to do a miracle that, you know, that, that no man could do. But the funny thing is, when I was in that church for the seven years, and we had miracle rally after miracle rally, people coming forward for healings. We had healings being called out by all the visiting evangelists. The Lord tells me, you know, he's healing this person, he's healing that person, and so forth. And even though the, the pastor himself seemed to believe, that hundreds, if not thousands of peoples or healings were taking place under his ministry. In the seven years that I was there, I saw that many miracles. Nothing that made my jaw drop, nothing that amazed me, nothing that stopped traffic, because everything was a warm feeling or it was something you couldn't see. These are not the miracles that Jesus and his apostles did. The miracles they did were obvious. People saw them and it scared them. They were so powerful. These are not the kind of miracles that these people are actually you know, performing. Now that's with regard to health, but what should we say with regard to wealth? Does the Lord want you to be rich? Well, not in the vast majority of cases. Uh, for one thing, not many of us are rich. The Bible says actually just the opposite it's far better to be financially challenged than to be financially enriched. Unless the Lord gives you the exceptional gift of, of being able to manage riches because quite often riches destroy people. Uh, James points out that the rich were actually the adversaries of the church. James writes in James 2 verses 5 through 6, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? You want to favor the rich? These are your enemies. Now, it's not, not always the case, but often the case. The Lord tells us that we need to be careful with regard to material wealth because if we're not content with what the Lord has given to us and we desire to become rich, it can actually run us into all kinds of sin. This is what he says to Timothy. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of many is excuse me, the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Basically, what Paul is saying is that those who want to be rich are going to be tempted to fall away from the Lord and that it is a snare. It plunges men into ruin and destruction. And yet, the health and wealth gurus say, this is what God wants you to do. He wants you to be rich. All you need to do is give and God will bless you and give you these things which Paul says to desire is to be your undoing. Remember what we saw in our meditation, that those who are rich are going to be tempted to think that they do not need the Lord. Uh, Agur writes in Proverbs 30, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I be not full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. It's interesting that uh, years ago when, by God's grace, he put a group of people together that were willing to go out and do street evangelism. We, we went out and we did this skit in various places. We, we went to the places where you had somewhat affluent people that were middle class, maybe upper middle class. And we went to places where people were really down and out, uh, the people who were in the bars and on the, on the boardwalk and that type of thing. And we found that as we went out to minister the gospel that there were many more open doors 
where there was the poverty and the, you know, the, the down and out folks uh, versus those that were affluent who didn't want to listen to us at all. Why do I need the Lord? I've got everything I need. I've got a full bank account. I've got a nice car. I've got a nice house. I, do, I don't need the Lord. I've, I'm fine. But the others recognized that, yeah, they did have needs. Well, that's what Agar was talking about in Proverbs 30. Now, going on with this, rather than seeking riches, the Lord tells us that we actually have to be willing to let go of them in order to follow him. If we are to be his disciples, we have to be willing to let go of all our possessions. Now, again, he's not saying that we need to get rid of everything or give everything away, but he is saying that if that's what the Lord would call us to do, we must be willing to do it. Luke 14, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Rather than seeking for more possessions, the Lord says you have to be willing to give up the ones you have in order to follow him. Remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus asking him, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? When Jesus told him, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me, he left downcast because he could not part with his riches. And he left the Lord without salvation because his possessions possessed him. Jesus then turned to his disciples and said this, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The reason being is that riches can possess you, and they often do, you see. It's hard to give them up. The rich young ruler could not give them up. Many could not let go of their possessions in order to follow Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you have to be willing to do this. He's not telling you, lust after more possessions, give so I can give to you more things that will be a snare to your soul. He says you have to be willing to let go of it. To follow him. Now I believe that that's why the Lord doesn't give wealth to too many individuals. He does, well, Edwards pointed out, he gives wealth to the wicked because he realizes that it's a snare to his people and it's worthless. He gives it to the wicked, but he won't often give it to his own people. And you know, the health and wealth gurus will often point out, well, you know, look at David. Wasn't he rich? Didn't God bless him with riches? And didn't he bless Solomon with riches? Well, yes, he did, but look at what those riches did to them. David was a man after God's own heart when he was a shepherd in, the, in you know, taking care of the flock, and then the Lord elevated him to, to be king. But after a while, he got kind of comfortable and didn't go out with uh, his armies to war and happened to see Bathsheba, committed adultery with her, and then had her husband put to death. It was because of the luxury that was afforded him by his wealth. And you know what happened to Solomon? perhaps the richest man who's ever existed in the world, married multiple wives, all this wealth and all, the, all this uh, opportunity that the wealth gave him led him away from the Lord. He began actually to worship other gods. The wealth became their undoing. It was not a blessing to them, but it actually ended up being more of a curse. Very few saints were able to possess riches without being destroyed by those riches. So again, is it God's will that you be rich? I would say no, because the Bible says the riches will destroy you, and desiring them will destroy you. You have to be willing to give all that you have to the Lord in order to follow him. He doesn't want you to seek after riches. So again, let, let's just make some application from this with regard to uh, you know, what we understand now as far as what the scripture says with regard to our health and wealth uh, or material goods and our material well-being. What should we do? Well, if you're sick, you should pray. You should go to the doctor. God has given doctors to heal you as well, right? I mean... The Lord never made a promise that, that if you're sick, just pray and God's going to make you well. God has given to us doctors. There were doctors even in the days of the apostles. Luke was a doctor. Might have been primitive, but there were still some things he could do. 
So, yes, pray, ask God for healing. Go to the doctor, you know, and the Lord may use the doctor to heal you. Sometimes it's right to go to the elders for prayer, as uh, James tells us, that they might anoint you with oil and pray. But realize that even if you do these things, it's still possible that the Lord may not heal you. Now, it's not because you don't have enough faith. It's because God has chosen not to heal you at this time. By the way, if the doctor treats you and you're healed, that's still the Lord healing you. He's the one who gave that ability. He's the one who gave the technology, the knowledge, the medicine, whatever else is necessary. He hasn't healed you because he has a purpose for that particular affliction. There's something he wants to teach you, something he wants you to know. Perhaps the same thing the Lord taught the Apostle Paul through his weakness, and that is that you should seek the Lord's strength in your weakness, that you should trust the Lord and wait upon him and learn what he wants you to learn. Now, the Lord also wants you to draw upon his strength and realize that it's not your strength he's going to use, but rather he's going to use his strength. And it's most often when we are our weakest that God shows himself to be strong through us and he uses us. But while you're waiting for the Lord, waiting for him to teach you, waiting for him perhaps to restore your health, if that's what he's willing to do, make sure that you're still serving him with the strength that you do have. So if you're sick, go down this avenue. And if you're not healed, remember, it's not because you don't have enough faith. It's because God has another purpose for it. And remember that his purposes are always good purposes. He means it out of love. What he wants to teach you is good. You need to see it. We all need to learn it. We need to learn our dependence on it. If you're in need, same thing is true. You need to pray. You need to look for work. But if the Lord hasn't provided, it's not because you don't have enough faith. The Lord, necessarily, the Lord has brought you into the situation because there's something he wants to teach you. You need to wait on him as well. You need to make sure that you are meeting the conditions that God has, has given in order to meet your needs, which is seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You need to make sure that when God does uh, give to you that you're being faithful in your giving to him because God does, in fact, command us to give. But if you're doing that and the Lord still hasn't met your needs, it's because there's something else that he wants to teach you, and you need to wait on him until you understand what that lesson is. Seek to learn from him. Now, again, remember, he may not necessarily make you rich. As a matter of fact, he's going to make, not going to make most of his people rich because he knows riches are not good for you, but he will take care of your needs. <clears throat> By the way, <clears throat> you don't have to be rich to be happy, do you? You don't need a great deal of wealth. Paul said to Timothy, if we have food and covering, clothing and shelter and food, that's really all we should be looking for and all we really need because that will sustain your life. And then when you have those needs met, you can do what the Lord has actually made you to do and called you to do. That's all you really need to do that, to serve him, is have those particular needs met. So he may not give you riches, but he will meet your needs. And so you do need to be content during that time through your illness or through your need and trust that the Lord <clears throat> has a good purpose in what he is doing and that he will show you in his time exactly what it is he is trying to teach you. And he will cause you to grow more into the image of his son. So again, far from promising us that we're going to be healthy, God actually uses sickness to teach us things we need to learn. Far from uh, promising that he'll make us rich, he's not going to destroy us by making us rich. He loves us too much. But he will take care of our needs, and he will provide even beyond what we need uh, to, to exist. God is good. He is gracious. But he will always make sure that he gives us just what we need and not enough to undo us. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's um, come to the Lord.
and ask him to take what we've seen and, and to apply it. I think in, in some cases it's more applicable uh, because we happen to be going through these particular difficulties uh, now than it may be for others, but really this is for all of us, uh, especially with regard to continuing health or continuing provision because this is what the Lord has promised. This is what we can expect. This is what we ought to look to him for. So let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and ask for the Lord's uh, application.